Allah Ta'ala gives mercy to everyone. Just like rain falls on everyone, whoever you are, rain falls on you. Rahim, we said, is like a mother's love to her child. And what does this mean? It means that suppose I have a child and I'm babysitting four other children. Okay. I love all five children. Okay. But the one who is my own child, I love differently than all the rest. So Rahim is a particular relationship of mercy that Allah Ta'ala has with each and every one of us. So, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, we also say that this one ayah sums up the entire deen. If you understand Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, you understand the entire deen. And then Ali radiallahu an, he takes it further. This is beyond my intellect. He says, if you understand the B, then you understand the entire deen. And that I don't understand how it works. B for Bismillah, B. Yeah. He says all of it is summed up in B, but that's that's beyond my my intellect. Right. So if you understand Bismillah rahman rahim, you understand the whole deen. Secondarily, if you understand Al Fatiha, you understand the whole deen. So what is the rest of Al Fatiha? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahman Rahim, Maliki Yom Deen. Praise and gratitude are due to Allah. When we say Alhamdulillah, we usually only translate it as praise. But it's praise and gratitude. Praise is thana in Arabic. Gratitude is shukr in Arabic. Hamd is thana and shukr. Hamd is praise and gratitude. Okay. The closest word in English is probably appreciation. Appreciation of Allah. Okay. So, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Rabb and some of this is repetition for a lot of you. Rab is the one who takes something from immaturity to maturity according to its design. So when we say Allah is Rabbil Alameen, He takes every, all the worlds from immaturity to maturity according to the design of every world. Or if we speak about people, He takes every person from immaturity to maturity according to the design of each person. What is the point here? The point is that Allah Ta'ala is intimately involved with every single step of our lives. Okay? You understand that, I understand that, but a lot of people in our culture, when we say that about Allah Ta'ala, people get surprised. That usually in our culture, by our culture I'm saying American culture, when people speak of God, they speak of God as someone who is far away. Okay? And we're saying Allah Ta'ala, we all know He is closer than our neck vein, but He is running every single step. Okay? Now, Again, it says Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, and one is one of the lessons of the repetition. Bismillah, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. What is the lesson here? At the very least, emphasis of all the attributes of Allah Taala. The one that is emphasized is mercy, 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 mercy. Think of how different Surah Al Fatiha would be if instead of saying Bismillah, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, it said Bismillah, Al Jabbar, Al Qahar. So Al-Jabbar is, is like the, the overpowering, Al-Qahar is the subduing. So how different would Al-Fatiha be? If instead of Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, it's Al-Jabbar, Al-Qahar. Okay. Sorry? Yeah, it's very, very, it would be a fearful uh, relationship with Allah Ta'ala. This is a hopeful relationship. Now think about this. If Allah Ta'ala's primary relationship with me is Rahma, that means when I look at my life, my primary attitude should be hope. Okay. Ask yourself, if you think of your future, do you have hope or do you have fear? We should all have hope and fear. You should have more hope than fear in terms of your dunya. Okay. You should have more hope than fear when you look at your own dunya today and in the future. Okay. But on the day of judgment, it should be a balance. You should have hope and fear. So he is also master of the day of judgment. Again, all of this we know. But the key thing I want you to take is that the primary relationship that Allah Ta'ala has with us is mercy. Okay. The second half of the surah focuses on our relationship with Allah. The first key point here is the Arabic here, is emphasizing that this is only to Allah. Okay, if this said na'buduka wa nasta'inuka, that's different. That would be say, you we worship, you we ask for help. This is iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. You don't need to remember this uh, for, for now. The point is that we are saying to you alone do we worship, to you alone do we ask for help. But this word ibadah, okay, 
the more literal translation of this word ibadah is the most extreme form of love. Okay. This ibadah that we translate also as service, even as slavery, this is a voluntary slavery. This is a voluntary loving slavery. So think of love. What do I do when I love a beloved, a spouse, a child, a parent, you know, a friend? You, you think about your beloved, right? You wish you could be with them. What are you saying? You adore your beloved, right? And that will get into adoration also. You might even change yourself to become like what your beloved wants. Okay? And also you, you, uh, you value whatever your beloved values. Okay? Deeper than, uh, than, work, than love is to adore when you are saying your beloved is above me. Okay? And then deeper than that is worship. Meaning you surrender completely. Okay? Think about this. This whole deen also talks so much about love, but we don't ever hear about this in our Jummah khutbahs. Right? You know? We hear about fear in our Jummah khutbahs. Okay. So what else are we saying? Looking at this Arabic form, we are saying you we worship. We do not worship anyone else. Okay? You we will worship, we will not worship anyone else. Four meanings when we say iyyaka na'budu. We worship you, we will worship you. We do not worship anyone but you, we will not worship anyone but you. Okay. Same thing for wa iyyaka nasta'in. We ask you for help, we ask no one else for help. We will ask you for help, and we will not ask anyone else for help. Okay. Now, what is the primary help that I'm asking Allah Ta'ala here for? It's guidance. It's hidayah. Okay. Which brings us to the latter part of the surah. اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاتُ وَالْمُسْتَقِيمُ صِرَاتُ وَالَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرِ الْمَغْدُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَلْضَالِّينَ So guide us on the straight path, the path of those whom you have favored, not the path of those on whom is anger, nor of those who are astray. Another central point of our, of our tradition. I said one central point is that our tradition focuses on bringing people together. The word for Islamic law? Sharia, the path that leads to water. Okay? Or even within Sharia, what do we call, the, what is the word for the schools of law? Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi, what is that? Madhab, which is the way that you go. What is the word for biography of the Prophet, peace be upon him? Sira, which is the way someone has walked. This idea that the path is always part of our tradition. And what do we understand? With the path, you have a destination. Okay? With the path, you're also moving all the time. Okay? So what is the destination of the straight path? What is the end point of the straight path? Jannah or Allah Ta'ala, or the pleasure of Allah Ta'ala. Okay? Again, all of us know this. This is just to, just to review for everyone. But then we define the straight path in three ways. The path of those whom you have favored, not of those on whom is anger, nor of those who are astray. Now, can you name me anyone in history who never received a favor from Allah Ta'ala? Silly question, right? Everyone receives favors. So when I'm asking Allah Ta'ala to show me your favors, what am I asking for? I'm asking Allah Ta'ala... Guide me to see my life as favors. Okay. Show me the favors in my life. Okay. If I see my life as favors from Allah Ta'ala, how do I respond? With shukr, with gratitude, which is alhamdulillah. Okay. al-maghdubi alayhim. Okay. There's a problem in the way we often translate this. And here... Uh, is, is the same problem. It says, not the path of those who earn thine anger. غَيْرِ الْمَغْدُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ does not mention Allah Ta'ala here. غَيْرِ الْمَغْدُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ not of those on whom is anger. Okay. And what is the point here? That the first way to look at the path is the path of gratitude. The second way to look at the path is not to be on the path of anger. What am I saying here? That the opposite in your heart of gratitude is anger. Okay? The opposite in your heart of gratitude is anger. One will be stronger than the other one. Okay? And then, وَلَدَّالِي and those are the people who are lost. Now, why do translators or commentators speak of Allah's anger? One is because if I'm responding to Allah's favors with anger, 
then the response is ghadab ala ghadab, right? So anger upon anger. But it's not part of the actual text. A second lesson here is that in the adab of speaking about Allah Ta'ala, we only speak about good things. Okay? In the adab of speaking about Allah Ta'ala, we speak of rahmah. Okay? So even it is not good adab to say that Allah Ta'ala created evil. Okay? Did Allah Ta'ala create everything? Yes, He did. But what do we say? Whatever is bad, we assign it to us. Whatever is good, we assign it to Allah Ta'ala. Yeah, okay, sir. Yeah. Um, grammatically, why is, why is it the opposite? No, there's there's many opposites. There's many opposites um, um, between uh, gratitude and anger. You can say one opposite of shukr, for example, is kufr, right? And I'm saying in the context of my response to what Allah gives me, I respond either with gratitude at one end of the spectrum or ingratitude, and I'm saying ingratitude is, is essentially um, um, anger. Good question. Okay. So what are we saying? Al-Fatiha is basically a dua, and it's a dua asking to make me grateful. Okay. Now, what else am I asking for? What is the answer? How do I know about gratitude? Or how do I know what the straight path is? If we open up in Surah An-Nisa, Surah 4. Okay, so it says that we should give them um, from our presence immense reward and we'll guide them on the straight path. And who are the people on the straight path? Uh, whoever obeys Allah and his messenger. So one key of being on the straight path is obedience. Okay. All of us know this, but why am I emphasizing this? Because this is easy to forget. Okay. That central to being on the straight path is obedience of Allah Ta'ala. Okay. And these are the people who Allah Ta'ala has given favor to. Okay. So what am I saying here? When I fulfill obedience to Allah Ta'ala, look at that as a favor from Allah Ta'ala. We just, mashallah, we just prayed Maghrib. Look at that as a favor that Allah Ta'ala gave to us. Okay. And then who are these people that Allah Ta'ala has given favor? Prophets. The Siddiqeen. Here it says the saints. What is Siddiq? Someone who recognizes truth. Okay. The Shuhada. We all know the Shuhada, the martyrs. The Salihin. The people who are upright or the righteous. And uh, and these are the best of, of, of company. This is also how to recognize the people on the straight path. Okay, the prophets, they have come and gone. You know, may, Allah, uh, uh, may Allah's blessings be upon them. The, the, the Siddiqeen, the Shuhada, the Salihin. So what are we saying? That a benefit of being on the straight path is you can recognize truth. Okay. A benefit of being on the straight path related to the shuhada. What is what is a shaheed? Someone who gave his or her life. Okay. So someone who is becoming more and more giving is part of the straight path. And last, salihin, you have upright character. Okay. And we all understand this. We've talked about this quite a bit in previous classes. That often when we think of upright Islam, we only think of namaz and fasting and everything. You also have to have upright character. Okay. So this is al-fatiha. How's the speed? Is it too much information? Okay. Okay. Those of you who know who know my class know this pace will be much slower starting next week, inshallah. But I just want to put everyone together. Okay. Now looking at Al Baqarah, the name Al Baqarah. Uh, there are many theories, but essentially the common belief is that this refers to a story. This is Ayah 67 through 71, the story that we all know of Musa alayhi salam telling his people to slaughter a cow. Okay. That this is where the name came from. Now, the primary function of the name of a surah, on the one hand, it's also following the Prophet, peace be upon him. Many of the names of the surahs we get straight from the Prophet, peace be upon him. Like if I open up a very old, old, old Quran, I'm not going to see the names there. Okay? But we know from the tradition that this is where the names are coming from very often. Uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, gave us many names for Al-Fatiha. Another one is Ash-Shifa, the cure. Okay? <coughs> And then other scholars will also add new names. Another common name that I don't think is from the Prophet, peace be upon him, for Al-Baqarah is the Surah, uh, surah uh, Ummatain, the Surah of the two Ummas. Because what is Al-Baqarah about? It's, a, it's about the Ummah of Musa, peace be upon him, and the Ummah of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now let me give you an overall outline of this Surah. Okay. So Surah Al-Baqarah, and those of you who've been taking my classes, uh, you've seen this before. One, two, three, four, five. So Ayahs 1 through 39 
is essentially what we would call for our purposes the introduction. Yeah. And we're going to go through this. And then I uh, 40 to 123 is the Ummah of Musa. Ummah of Musa, peace be upon him. I'm just putting a little P. Okay. And then I, uh, you're going to see this overlaps. 75 to 284 is the Ummah of Muhammad. Peace be upon him. So 1 through 39 is the introduction. I have 40 through 123 is the Ummah of Musa. Peace be upon him. I have 75 to 284 is the Ummah of Muhammad. Peace be upon him. And then the last two ayahs, last two ayahs are the conclusion. So this is the outline of Surah Al-Baqarah. Four parts. Introduction, the story of the Ummah of Musa, peace be upon him, and then the uh, address to us, the Ummah of Muhammad, peace be upon him, and then the conclusion. Yeah. The conclusion all of you are, are familiar with, the last two ayahs of Al-Baqarah, this is what the Prophet, peace be upon him, received in, in the night journey, in Isra wal Ma'raj. Right? The last two eyes of Al Baqarah, okay, which we're going to talk about in detail when we get to it, inshallah. Okay. So, <clears throat> may, may I go to back to the? Uh, does anyone still need to look at this? You have it? Okay. We can come back to this if, if need be. So, Ayah 139 of Al Baqarah. First, we begin with Alif Lam Mim, okay. Now, if I ask any group of Muslims, tell me about Alif Lam Mim, everyone is going to say, only Allah knows what it means. Okay? That's true for the whole Quran. Okay? What should we understand about Alif Lam Mim? If I believe Allah knows what this means, if I believe I don't know what this means, what have I done? I've begun to surrender to Allah. I've surrendered my intellect. I'm saying there's intellect that I don't have. Okay? If I'm saying I don't know what this means, but Allah knows what this means. Further, if I look at a mushaf of the Qur'an and I see this alif lam mim, how do I know that this is pronounced alif lam mim? If I just look at it on the page, it just looks like alama. How do we know? Exactly. How? Because someone taught me. And someone taught that person. And someone taught that person. Someone taught that person. Going back 1400 years. Okay. What am I saying? That when we usually think of Islam, we think of the Qur'an and we think of the Hadith. Okay? This misses the point. Think of the Prophet, peace be upon him, through whom we get the Qur'an. From Allah Ta'ala to the Prophet, we get the Qur'an. From Allah Ta'ala to the Prophet, peace be upon him, we have another type of wahi, which we call uh, wahi ghair matlu. The Qur'an is wahi matlu, recited wahi. And then we also have wahi ghair matlu, which is non recited wahi, which is what we call the sunnah, which is what is collected in the hadith. Okay? But how do we learn this? We learn this from person to person to person. Just like I ask all of you, how would you learn how to pray? All of you will say, I learned from someone else. Maybe my parents. Maybe I learned it in from my school. Okay? Ask every Muslim in the world, how did you learn how to pray? Okay? Maybe they will start with a book. Maybe they'll start with a video. Maybe they'll even start with the internet today. But you, when do you learn how to pray? When you're praying with other people. That's when you really learn how to pray. And what am I saying here is that a central part of our deen is what is being handed off. Silsila. Okay? That I'm getting this and I'm being taught and it was taught by someone who was taught by someone going back to the Prophet, peace be upon him. So one lesson of Alif Lam Mim is I've surrendered my intellect to Allah Ta'ala. A second lesson of Alif Lam Mim is that how do I know how to pronounce this? Because this is what is being taught. 
by a teacher who learned from someone who learned from someone who learned from someone. Going back to the Prophet, peace be upon him. Now think about how important this is. What is the Arabic word? The second part of, surah, of this section, ayah 2 through 20. Ayah 2 through 20 gives us models of belief and rejection. First model is the model of the person who has taqwa. This is the book, no doubt, guidance for those who, this says word of evil, hudallil muttaqeen, those who have taqwa. The first is the person who has taqwa. So let me just type that for you. So I1 is alif lam meme. I uh, two through twenty is uh, types of belief and rejection. This is probably going to be too clumsy. I might have to stop doing this. So, uh, let's do this. The wonderful things we can do with an iPad. Hold on. Okay. Types of belief and rejection. Within this, the first type is taqwa. Okay, ayah 2 through 5 talks about the people who have taqwa. And we have six attributes. You don't need to remember these. These are, these are right there in your translation. They believe in the unseen. They establish salah. They spend of what Allah has bestowed upon them. They believe in what has been sent down to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They believe in what has been sent down before him, and they are certain of the hereafter. What is common among all of these six traits? These people have trust in Allah. That the person of taqwa has trust in Allah. Okay. That the person of taqwa guides his or her life directed toward Allah Ta'ala. Okay. The second type of person in ayahs 6 and 7 is the kafir. Now one thing to think about. Uh, very commonly in our community we like to use the word kafir for, for anything and everything. This is a very heavy word. Okay, what is a kafir? A kafir is someone who feels compelled to turn to Allah and they push it down. Okay. We often say a kafir and non-Muslim is the same. No, no, this is, this is not correct within the Quran. You can say within Islamic law, you can argue that it might be the same, but within the Quran, kafir and non-Muslim is not the same. Okay. What is a kafir? A kafir is someone who feels compelled to turn to Allah. They want to turn to Allah, but they're not letting themselves do it. So what is kafir, what is kufr? They're, they're covering it. Okay. That is a kafir. So be very cautious about using kafir. Don't use kafir for non-Muslims. Okay. Because a non-Muslim might be a jahil, meaning they don't know. Okay. And there's other issues too. I mean, we'll talk much later on, perhaps if we get to Ali Imran, uh, are there believers among the kafirs? The next category is munafiq, the hypocrite. This is ayah 8 through 16. We have a number of attributes of, of the monophics. You don't have to remember this for now. It's all in the Quran. One attribute of the monophics here is that they lie. Another attribute of the monophic is that they, that they deflect any criticism. If you try to criticize them, say, they say, no, we're actually doing proper. We're, we're, proper, we're doing things properly. Another category of the monophic is that they're arrogant. Okay. And another category of monophics is that they have two faces. When they're with the believers, they say, we're with you. When they're with shaitans, they say, we're actually with you. Okay. But what is common among all of these traits? We said, what about the person of taqwa? What do we say? They trust Allah. The monophic distrusts Allah. Okay. The person of taqwa has trust in Allah. The monophic has distrust of Allah. Now, also, think about this, that if I was going to teach you Islam, 
you know, if I go to a church and I'm teaching Islam, I'm only going to talk about happy things. Okay? You know, Allah is so merciful, right? The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is so, is so, so generous, right? But Allah Ta'ala teaching us Islam, first we're talking about uh, uh, Surah Al-Fatiha, very generous surah. We're talking about the people of Taqwa, very, very nice. Then we talk about Kafirs and Munafiks. Yeah. So what is the lesson here? The lesson here is that this is serious material, right? And this is serious material for each of us to think about. Now, why am I saying that here? You and I know that Abu Bakr was very concerned about being a Munafiq. Ahmad was very concerned about being a Munafiq, right? And the two examples, two very common stories. One, the Prophet, peace be upon him, speaks to Hudhaifa. May Allah be, peace be upon the Prophet, and may Allah be pleased with Hudhaifa. And he tells Hudhaifa, he don't tell anyone, but that person, that person, that person is, is a Munafiq. And then Omar hears about this, and so Omar asks him, okay, did the Prophet give you my name? Okay. This is Omar who is concerned. And Hudayfa says, I can't tell you who the names are, but I can tell you you're not the, one of those people. Okay. And according to some reports, he asked this again and again in the future. Okay. And then the story of Abu Bakr, another companion, his name is Handala, Ya Rahmatullah. Handala, he's walking down the street saying, Nafaka Handala, Nafaka Handala, which you can translate as Handala has become a hypocrite, or to really look at the meaning of Nafaka, he has perished. The word Nafak means you've, like, you're, you've just used up everything, you're just perished. Okay? And Abu Bakr says, Why are you saying this? Okay? And Handala says, when I'm with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, my iman is so high. When I'm away from him, my iman feels like it goes down. Okay? And Abu Bakr says, I have the same problem. Okay? So let's ask Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they ask the Prophet, peace be upon him, and he says, if uh, your iman is so high with me because I'm the Prophet, okay? if your iman was always this high, then when you're lying down in bed, angels would come to try to shake your hand. Okay. So this is natural. But the point I'm making is that the super companions, Abu Bakr and Omar, for example, may Allah be pleased with them, they were concerned about nifaq. And so therefore, my suggestion to all of us is to be very concerned about, about nifaq. Next section of the surah, we have, we have metaphors, which I'm not going to talk about much. The next section is Ayah 21 through 29. And here, commentators say, essentially, that this is the summary of the Qur'an in Makkah. Okay. What the Prophet, peace be upon him, received in Makkah is summarized in Ayah 21 through 29. When is Al-Baqarah revealed? When? Makkah or Medina? Medina, right? Is, um, um, essentially, Al-Baqarah is in one way a call to the Jews of Medina. Ali Imran is a call to the, the, the Christians. So 21 through 29 sums up the, the Makki Quran. Okay. What do we have? I 21, be the abd of your Rabb. Okay. Be the worshiper of your Rabb. This is the first command. Okay. You're going to hear me, those of you who haven't taken my class, I'm going to ask again and again and again, what's the first command? What's the second command? What's the third command? When I open up the Quran, Al-Fatiha doesn't have any commands. The first page of Al-Baqarah doesn't have any commands. This is the first command. Now, this is not the same as what the Prophet received. First command that the Prophet receives, peace be upon him, is Iqra, right? Saying so the way the Prophet has organized the Quran for us, this is now the first command for us. Be the Avdi of, of, of your Rabb. Second command at the end of Ayah 22. Do not set up rivals to Allah knowingly. Okay? First two commands are our relationship with Allah Ta'ala. But what else do we have here? Ayah 22 speaks about nature. He made the earth a resting place for us. He made the sky a canopy. He causes water to come down from the sky, making fruits. If you read all the books of all the different religions, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, the Tao, nobody talks about nature as much as the Quran does. Okay. They all talk about nature. Hindu books talk about nature. The Tao talks about nature. Okay. Or those books do. But no one talks about the nature as much as the Quran does. Okay. And think about this. Because what is nature? Nature is one of the ayahs of Allah. Just like the, what we're looking at are ayahs of Allah. Nature is also ayahs of Allah. Okay. What else do we have? The prescription, ayah 23 and 24, if you have doubt. 
We often say this to the world that this is the challenge. Okay, bring a surah like this. Okay. Here, this is a prescription if you have doubt. In other places in Surah Hud, it's a challenge to the kuffar. You don't believe this? Bring something just as good. Okay. Here, what is the concern? If you have doubt about the Quran, then try to write something. Okay. For you and I, this is not much of an issue. For many college students, this is an issue. Many, many college students, many high school students come to me saying, yeah, I have doubt. How do I know this is the word of Allah? Okay. Then eventually I lead them to this. Sometimes they have other problems. But, and I tell them, okay, go read everything else. Okay. Third command. First command, be the abd of your rab. Second command, do not make rivals to Allah. Third command, I 25, give glad tidings. Here it says, O Muhammad, because this is a grammatical singular. To, to those who believe and do good works, that they will have gardens beneath which rivers flow. Okay. So the first command is our relationship with Allah. Second command is our relationship with Allah. Third command is our relationship with each other. What is the command? Say to each other, good news. Okay. May Allah reward you. May Allah bless you. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakum Allahu khairan. Okay. All these things. Say this to each other. At the end of this section, 26 and 27, 28 and 29, now it gets into some other very simple teachings. Um, for our purposes, let's just look at Ayah 27. At the end of Ayah 26, Allah Ta'ala says that He guides many and He misguides many, but he, or He lets many get misguided. But He does not misguide anyone except for at the end, if you can see at the end of Ayah 26, the Fasiqeen. What is a Fasiq? The, the analogy of a fasik is think of a river and the water is bursting beyond the river. What is a fasik? Someone who crosses all the boundaries. Okay. So we have a person of taqwa is one type of person. A kafir is another type of person. A monafik is another type of person. A fasik is someone who has no shame. A monafik, a hypocrite, has shame. If I'm a hypocrite, I don't want anyone else to know. A fasik doesn't care. And then we have three attributes of the Fasik. Number one, they break their relationship with Allah after confirming it. Number two, they split what Allah has ordered to be joined. And number three, they make mischief in the earth. Number one, they break their relationship with Allah. What is this relationship with Allah? The most common understanding is referring to the time long before we were born, where Allah Ta'ala pulled us all together and said, Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your rub? And all of us said, yes, you are. Okay. The second one, they split what other Allah has ordered to be joined. <coughs> Excuse me. What are we saying here? This is usually referring to family, your personal relations, right? If you have relatives and you cut off your relationships with your relatives without any good reason, okay, that's a problem. Okay. The third, they make fasad in the world. Another way to look at this, the first one is people who do mischief with their relationship with Allah, or they do mischief in the relationship with other people, or they do mischief in relationship with the world. Okay. These people are the losers. So what are we saying here? These are three keys for misguidance. And what's common among all these? The key to misguidance is misconduct. Misconduct, meaning if I am misbehaving in my relationship with Allah Ta'ala, I'm going down the path of potential misguidance. Ayah 30 through 39 is a story of Adam alayhi salam, right? Adam and Eve, peace be upon them, and the shaitan. Okay. The key thing to understand here is that this is actually the story of the fall of shaitan. Three parts of the story. First, Ayah 30 to 33. This is the announcement. Allah Ta'ala says he's going to make a khalifa on the earth. The angels say to him, are you going to make someone who sheds blood? Allah Ta'ala says, I know what you do not know. Okay. Again, I'm not going through all the details because we might already be familiar with them. Okay. He teaches Adam al Islam all the names. The names of what? One understanding is the names of everything. Another understanding is that the names of Allah Ta'ala. Okay. But he teaches Adam al Islam something he doesn't teach the angels. Okay. And then he says to, to the angels, okay, give me the names. And they say, Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma alamtana. We have no knowledge. Glory to you, we have no knowledge except for what you have given us. Okay. 
So what is the first lesson here is that Allah Ta'ala knows all. Second is Ayah 34. So as I said, there's three stories here. First is the announcement. The second is the story of the Sajda. Okay. Allah Ta'ala tells uh, all of the angels do Sajda before Adam. Okay. And there's two understandings here. Because Iblis, he refuses. One understanding, the common understanding is because Iblis was in the presence that this command also applied to him. Okay. The other is that the command was not for him, it was only for angels. In either case, Allah Ta'ala asks Iblis later on, this is in Surah Al-Kahf, when I gave the command, why didn't you do sajda? And we know what Iblis says. He says, uh, I'm better than him. You know, خَلَقْتَهُ مِنْ دِينَ خَلَقْتَنِي مِنْ نَارَ It's the other way around, actually. And, and so what was Iblis's problem? Number one, looking at the Arabic, Abba. Number two, was Takbara. Number three, Wakana min al-Kafirin. Abba, first he refuses. Number two, he became arrogant. And then as a result, he became like one of the rejectors. The problem here is this is the, uh, this is the fall of Iblis. Why? Because Allah Ta'ala tells Iblis what after this? Go, go to hell. And what does Iblis say? Don't send me to hell now, send me to hell later. What does Allah Ta'ala say? Granted. That's fine. Okay. I'm paraphrasing. And then Iblis makes a second dua. Okay, first dua accepted. Second dua. Okay. Your, it's your fault, Allah Ta'ala, that I'm going, that I have this problem. So I'm going to show you that you're wrong. I'm going to lead all of your worshippers astray. Okay. I'm going to sit on the straight path and take down all your worshippers. And what does Allah Ta'ala tell him? Paraphrase, he says, go ahead and try, but you're not going to get my true believers. So Iblis makes two du'as, both of them granted. But he never asks for forgiveness. Okay. And this is the fault, the failure of Iblis. Okay. In contrast, Ayah 35-39, we have Adam alayhi salam and Hawa. Okay. May peace be upon them both. They're told, go wherever you want, eat whatever you want, don't come to this tree. Iblis makes them forget, and they go to the tree. And then what happens? They start feeling remorse. So Allah Ta'ala gives them the dua. That if you feel this way, here's your dua. Rabbana thalamna anfusana, so forth and so on. Okay. And think about this, when all the duas that we learn about. We have these books, like Hisnul Muslim, Hisnul Haseen, and such. Um, and they say that, all right, if you see an eclipse, make this dua. If you wear a new shirt, make this dua, so forth and so on. And we're missing the point. Okay, obviously, yes, this is the, the proper dua. The way you feel when you put on a new shirt, the way to express that feeling is with this type of dua. The way you feel when you see an eclipse, okay, this is how you express it. So the way you feel when you feel this pain in your heart, I've done something wrong. You do the dua that Allah Ta'ala gave them. Okay. This is part of how dua works. These books are saying the feeling you have when a baby is born, this is the way you express it. The feeling that you have when you get a new house, this is the way you express it. So then they were sent down to earth. Why were they sent down to earth? Because they had to start their job as Khalifa. Now the key point I'm making here is don't look at it as punishment. That's not our tradition. They're sent down to earth to start their job. So that's the introduction. Okay. Information overload? Still okay? Okay. All right. I'll go through this a little bit more quickly because it's already 8.30. I have 40 through 123. There's two parts here. First part is I have 40 through 74. And this is the decline of the Ummah of Musa. Peace be upon him. 75 through 123 is how people behave when they reject.
etti. Okay. So in the section on the Umar Musa, there's two parts. First, their story. What is their story all about? They were most favored of all of dunya. And by the end, they were disgraced. And it was one problem. What was the one problem? Lack of? Or lack of gratitude? Gratitude, right? That they did not give shukr to Allah Ta'ala. This is the central problem that leads them from most favored status to disgrace status. We're not going to go through this in such detail like we did with the the first part of the Suda. But the key issue here is that we were looking, they went, they were first suffering among Fir'aun. It says, we delivered you from Pharaoh's folk. And then Allah Ta'ala gave them gift after gift after gift. But they did not respond with gratitude. Okay. And that was their central problem. Okay. They turned to the calf. Allah Ta'ala forgave them. Why? So that they become grateful. So that you give thanks. But they did not become grateful. Just like Al-Fatiha, central message of Al-Fatiha, guide me to be grateful. If I do not do that, then I'm going to have the same problem of Bani Israel. That if I am grateful, what happens? Allah Ta'ala will give me more. If I am not grateful, then I feel like I have nothing. Okay. That's this whole story. But then, starting from Ayah 75, the second half, Wrong things people do in terms of, or when people reject Allah, how do they behave? The first section, 75 to 82, again, you don't need to remember the specifics. We have a list of wrong things people do with the kitab of Allah. Wrong things people do with the Quran, or I mean, the Quran today, but at their time, the Torah. So... <clears throat> It's hard to see from, from the translation, but the first wrong thing is that they change the word of Allah. The second wrong thing is that they hide the truth. Third wrong thing is they just, they make stuff up. Okay? They act out of wishful thinking. Fourth wrong thing is they invent something and they say it is from Allah. And the fifth wrong thing is they, they develop philosophies that have no foundation. They say, we're, gonna, we're only going to go to hell for a short period of time. You don't need to remember these details. The key thing is one wrong place that people behave is how do they react to the book. The second wrong way that people behave is when they make a pact, a mithak, people break the, the pact. Okay. That leads then into... The next wrong thing, which is essentially, it's hard to see the ayahs here, but the first way is people do wrong with the book. Second way, people do wrong with their pacts, with their promises. Third thing that people do wrong is with the law itself. If I break the laws of Allah Ta'ala. Okay. Fourth wrong thing is uh, regarding the, the unseen. Remember just these key points. People misbehave with the book. People misbehave with their commitments, their promises. People misbehave with the law. People misbehave regarding the unseen. Okay. You don't need to remember this too much right now. We're going to be revisiting this. But you know what I mean by behaving wrong with the unseen? Black magic. Okay. That's behaving wrong with the unseen. Okay. Now, the, the, the next wrong thing that people do and this gets kind of philosophical, is they become tribalistic about, about their religious community. Okay, what do I mean here? Ask yourself, what is better? If someone Christian remains Christian, or someone Christian becomes atheist, what's better? That they remain Christian. Okay. Because what we're saying here is that, where'd it go? Many among the people of the book wish that we would become kafir. Okay. Ask yourself, what's better? If someone Jewish remains Jewish or they become atheist? A lot of Jews are atheists though, but uh, 
naturally, you don't want them to become atheists. Okay. And, but if I become envious about a different community, then I started thinking these strange things. You know, it's better that they leave their religion than becoming, uh, than remaining the religion. Anyway, having said that, the first big section about the Ummah of Muhammad, peace be upon him, is what we covered in the last class is 124 to, and I think it's 166, 168, 163. And this is basically about the Qibla, or it's about Ibrahim alayhi salam and the Qibla. So, Ayah 124 and 163, this is what we covered in, in the class volume 4. What are the key points here? And all of us know this. Okay? Ibrahim alayhi salam is one of the super Muslims of history. Okay? Allah Ta'ala gave him tests like he gave almost nobody except for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam passed all the tests. And then Ibrahim alayhi salam is told, with your son, rebuild the Kaaba. Okay? And then Ibrahim alayhi salam asks Allah Ta'ala, please give these people a messenger. And who's the answer? Muhammad is the, is the answer. How long did the dua take to get answered? Ibrahim alayhi salam is from how long ago? Before Jesus, right? So, so Ibrahim alayhi salam is from 5,000 years ago. Okay. Muhammad is from 1,400 years ago, peace be upon him. It took... 3,000 to 4,000 years for this dua to be answered. Okay. So think about this, that Allah Ta'ala changed the world over 3,000 years to make it ready for Muhammad, peace be upon him. Okay. And the other big point is the Qibla. These were the ayahs where we were switching the Qibla from Medina, from, from Jerusalem to, to, uh, to Mecca. And what is the key point for our purposes? That we are we all understand this, we are a different ummah than the previous people, the Jews and the Christians. Yeah. That we have a different sharia than the Jews and the Christians. The deen of all the prophets was the same, of Muhammad, Isa, and Musa, peace be upon him. Their sharia was different, but we are a different community. And what we're going to start from next week now, Ayah 164, is to now look at what does it mean. So what is the first, most of our class going to be for this whole year? We're going to look at what is Allah Ta'ala saying to the Ummah of Muhammad. Okay. So this was a super high speed review. And super information overload. Those people who have already taken the class will tell you we're going to go very, very, very slowly, inshallah. More, all the, you mean after al-Baqarah, what you're saying? Inshallah, we'll take a look. We'll see. <laughs> okay, any questions about anything, anything at all? Those of you who are new, uh, uh, you're, you're welcome, and please join us, and I think everything should be fine, inshallah. Oh, really? We have CDs now? Mashallah. Okay, big stuff. Yeah. Yeah, are they CDs or DVDs? Because we're the new generation. You know. oh, so, yeah, it's on YouTube. Yeah, it's all on YouTube. All the previous classes are on YouTube. Yeah. And we also have to make sure to, to make dua for Shadow because he's been recording all of these. Okay, so, so next week, inshallah, we're going to start right at 7 o'clock, and then we're going to take a break for Maghrib and then for our snacks for everything, and we're going to go from 7 to 8.30 uh, every Friday, inshallah. Okay, any other questions about anything, anything at all? Okay. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Subhanakallahumma, glory to you, O Allah, wa bihamdika, praise and gratitude are to you. Nashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta, we bear witness there is no God but you. Nastaghfiruka, we seek your forgiveness, wa natubu ilayk, and we turn to you. And may Allah Ta'ala reward all of you, and inshallah this should be a good class. And we'll continue next week. وآخر الدعوان أن الحمد لله رب العالمين